Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 68. Within six months from that, it was out earning what I was making as an attorney. Hi, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, and now it's time to light it up. Welcome to Gift Biz Unwrapped, your source for industry-specific insights and advice to develop and grow your business. And now, here's your host, Sue Monheit. Hi there, I'm Sue, and welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Whether you own a brick-and-mortar shop, sell online, or are just getting started, you'll discover new insight to gain traction and to grow your business. And today, I am so thrilled to have Angela Lee with us. Angela is an attorney and a goldsmith living in Austin, Texas. She opened her first Etsy shop in 2008 to sell simple jewelry that she created at her desk while working at a domestic violence hotline. Over the next few years, she developed her skills as an artisan. As her customer base grew, her hobby developed into a full-time business. Brightsmith sells custom handmade jewelry to people seeking effortlessly wearable pieces with an emphasis on craftsmanship. She also works as a public interest attorney serving Austin's thriving community of artists and musicians. I am so excited to talk with you, Angela. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Is there anything else you think we should add on to that intro before we get started? No, that that pretty much sums it up. I like to start out by having you describe a motivational candle. It gives us a subtle look into what you're all about. So if you were to describe a motivational candle, what color is it and what would be the quote on your candle? Well, my candle would be gray. I like the color gray because I've always been more interested in what's not there than what's there. And I think gray to me represents a possibility. The quote on it would be one by the furniture designer, Charles Ames, which is innovate as a last resort. Those familiar with Charles and Ray Ames work know that he was an incredibly innovative mid-century modern furniture designer. And what that quote means to me is that it reminds me that I'm never the first to encounter a problem. No matter what challenges I'm facing, there's always a system in place to address that problem. And I can build upon those systems to better what I'm doing or to solve my challenge at hand. And from a design sense, I've always been a big proponent of learning to do things the right way before doing it my own way. I'm very interested in making sure that I have the correct foundation for innovation. Also, since the quote would be on a candle, I think it'd be really interesting to see that candle as it burns down as a constant reminder of how often you find yourself at the point where all it says is last resort. That is so unique. I love the explanation in that whole thing that you just said, Angela, for a couple of reasons. Just by you saying someone else has been there before you kind of is a stress reliever. It's like, okay, I can figure this out because someone else has to. Someone else has figured out whatever the thing is that you're encountering. And in terms of foundations and learning from other people and then applying your own spin, It's kind of what we're doing here today because we want all our listeners to hear your story. You are providing a foundation for them to build upon because let's face it, we don't all have to reinvent the wheel from the beginning. We're much further along if we can pick up what other people already know and then add our spin on top of that. Absolutely. And it's so much easier when you accept and realize that almost everything under the sun has been done already. Right. But not your way. Exactly. There's always a way to build upon it or improve upon it. But without acknowledging the traditional way or the foundational way, it's difficult to distinguish yourself. Totally agree with you there. I'm going to take you back in time now to 2000, I guess it would be seven. And I want you to start going back and thinking about what it was like and give us the story of how you decided, you know what, I am going to transition from this beautiful jewelry that I'm already making and actually open an Etsy shop. So how did you just just make that first decision in the very beginning? It's kind of funny because I I don't feel like, especially in the beginning, that anything was driven by decision. It was more just kind of happenstance. And additionally, I never really set out to have a jewelry business. In the beginning, it was just something that I was doing and uh, kind of the business end came later after I discovered that it was a viable business, you know, there was a point when I decided that I was going to develop it into a business, but that was much, much later. So in 2007, I was a fledgling, you know, brand new baby attorney. And I'd always wanted to work in public interest. So I was working as an attorney on a domestic violence hotline. And 
if you can imagine what that's like, you essentially spend eight hours a day talking to people on the worst day of their lives. Domestic violence survivors are incredibly admirable, but also an incredibly challenging group. I remember there was a study that came out a few years ago that basically estimated the burnout rate of hotline workers at about 18 months. So right when I was nearing the 18 month mark, I was really starting to feel the stress of being yelled at for eight hours a day. And so I was looking for things to do while I was on the phone that would relieve my stress. And I figured, well, my hands are free because I'm using this headset. So let's see what I can do with my hands. It was wintertime. So I actually started by knitting. So I was knitting an amazing amount of things at my desk. And I wasn't even making anything. I was just kind of knitting straight lines and big pieces of cloth. And basically, you know, I discovered that I was a terrible knitter. So (laughs) (laughs) I kind of drew upon another craft that I'd always been interested in since I was little. I used to string beads together to make necklaces and things like that. And so I thought, well, that's something I can do without thinking too much. I can do it at my desk. And so I dragged up all my old craft supplies and I was making all sorts of weird things with no intent of making anything even that looked attractive. I was making things like chain mail from straight pieces of wire. And pretty soon I actually started making things that I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. And maybe I should kind of explore this further. So is that when you started your Etsy shop? No, no, not yet still. Okay. All right. So I started making different things and I soon became interested in developing my craft. I was like, well, I'm making these same things over and over again. So I started learning about different techniques, which of course required investment in tools and different materials. When I decided to develop my craft, that's when I decided to start selling online because I thought, well, this is a good way to kind of subsidize the craft from what I earn online. And I expected to be like maybe $10 a week or something like that. What I make online, I can use to put back into materials. So that's when I started the Etsy shop. And at the same time, I was also producing so much jewelry that I was literally giving it away. I was basically donating all of my pieces to silent auctions and things like that. And even that I eventually outgrew to the point where I had so much stuff and there were only so many silent auctions per year. I just started listing it on my Etsy store. So your goal initially was really just to reimburse yourself for the materials you were putting into the craft. Yeah, basically just to subsidize my hobby. Okay. And then why did you choose Etsy versus any other platform, selling your pieces on eBay or consignment at local shops, whatever? I hadn't given much thought to it, really. I had coincidentally at the same time heard about it on uh, NPR, and I thought I would give it a, a look. And within about two months, it was just really simple to set up a shop. So I was like, why not? And I went with it. So then you set up your shop. So you already had all the inventory, obviously, because it had been a hobby, really. And then you started putting your pieces up. And what was the result? It was slow going for a little while, but pretty much within the first few months, without any attention to anything like search engine optimization or anything like that, within a few months, I was seeing at least weekly sales. Wow. Were you so excited when you got that first sale? I was totally excited. And the woman who purchased from me ended up continuing to purchase from me. So It was kind of an early lesson in customer retention and customer acquisition and things like that. So it was really fun. And one thing that I didn't expect to like so much, one thing that I really learned from Etsy is that I really enjoyed running a business. Oh, interesting. Okay, so carry on with that. So what was it that you learned about running a business that you started seeing you had a passion for? Well, once I realized that things like, you know, search engine optimization and photography and marketing and merchandising... Once I kind of learned that these things existed and started learning about them, you know, I've always been so drawn to new challenges and things that I've never experienced that learning about all these things and kind of driving myself to master them became really fun. And I've really learned that online selling is only a small percentage about the product you actually make. And the majority of success can be attributed to just running the business. And where were you going to capture your knowledge? Does Etsy have the learning base or where were you going to, if you'd never been exposed to merchandising or SEO or any of that before, how were you getting your information? In the early days, they have a blog where they post tips for sellers. And that was a good resource in the early days. And now I am a frequenter of the Etsy forums and it's a very supportive group of sellers 
who will share knowledge or come with problems or, you know, any of the challenges that they're facing. And it's the closest thing that anyone who sells online from home will have to coworkers. <laughs> Wonderful. So are you suggesting then that XT is an all around turnkey opportunity for someone not only to start putting their product up like you were doing, because I'm understanding now that it is really easy to set up the shop, but then also continue learning through the forums and everything. Absolutely. It's so easy that sometimes it's even a detriment. I see a lot of times people will kind of start before they're ready. So I don't want to make it sound like you don't have to do your homework if you are going into it with the intent of it being a full-fledged business one day. But uh, it, it is probably the easiest platform out there. And what would you say are things that people need to have prepared before they get started? I think it's always a good idea to start with some sort of a brand in mind. I think one of the biggest mistakes that early sellers make is that they go in without kind of a, a direction and end up with a shop that's full of items that are maybe, you know, have completely different styles of photography or the products don't really make sense in a line. And then what happens with that is that they have this developed shop, but then they end up having to, for example, take all their photos over or have to remake all their prototypes to fit in with a specific brand or a line or, you know, philosophy. Okay. That's really good advice. So let me repeat that and emphasize it for everybody. If you're looking at setting up a shop, and we talk about this for not just on Etsy, but any company, you want to do some initial planning. What is it that you're presenting to the market? What is your product, as Angela is talking about right now? And then also, how are you putting your brand around it? What do you stand for? What's the image you're trying to create that comes out in the photography that you're doing? And you want everything to be looking consistent. You might have an Etsy platform, but you might also have a Facebook page or other types of social media or even an additional website. Or if you're a local retail shop, you might already have signage in your shop. You want all of that to be looking consistent across platform. But to start and to think about it before you put up your site on Etsy, as Angela is saying, is a big point of emphasis so that people understand what you're all about. You know, we, there's, the exactly. whole, there's the whole adage, you'll have to tell me if you agree with this, Angela, is that if you're everything to everybody, you're nothing to anybody. You know, you have to decide what you're standing for in terms of products and image. Exactly. All right. So let's carry on. So you were getting your first sales and things are moving and you saw that you liked business. What happened next? Well, after about two years when sales got very regular and I was still had the full-time job as an attorney and I was essentially spending all of my free time filling orders every weekend, every evening, late into the night, I actually eventually ended up closing my shop because it got too busy. Oh, wow. You can just temporarily shut it down, right? So you can catch up? You can, but it was at a turning point, both in, in my career as an attorney and, and kind of in my home life, I was facing some challenges. So I shut down my store for two years. Oh, wow. And did you have it? So was it still existing on Etsy? It was just turned off or something? Yeah, it still existed online. I just didn't have any listings. Okay. You know, many might see that as a, a failure of the business if you're concentrating on the business. But at the time for me, my priorities were kind of different. You know, I'd only been a, an attorney for a few years. And so I still wanted to concentrate on that. I was just reading an article last night. It was an excellent article. It was in a Seattle paper about a crafter whose business kind of took off overnight. And she ended up facing some personal issues and her business tanked because of it in a way that was just spectacular. She, she tanked spectacularly. Basically, her client base ended up crucifying her online and she is now in a situation where she can probably never reopen again because she's kind of lost the reputation that she built. You know, I think that's a very strong cautionary tale that you have to constantly keep on top of things and manage your growth. And if you find yourself in a place where you think you might actually be damaging your business by not keeping up with the growth, then you might need to stop and reassess. And I think that's a unique challenge of our listeners because we're all crafters, handmade, or for the most part, you know, some people are purchasing other people's products, but the more business you then get, the more work you're making for yourself because you have to produce the products and then also put them up on the Etsy site, and then at the end, fill all the orders. So it is a juggling act, I would suggest. Right. And I guess the point, too, is that you have to manage your growth. 
So many people are driven by, oh, I'm making this many sales in so many days, and they keep driving for that number when that number is only one metric. The more important metric is how happy are your customers and how many of your customers can you retain and you need to look at the reputation you're building. So it doesn't do any good to have 5,000 sales in a year if only 3,000 of those customers are happy because eventually your business will fail. Right. And just like you were saying, then you shut down and really can't start up again for sure under that brand name, possibly something different. You know, the person you were talking about who you read about last night clearly can start up under a different name later, but they've lost all that they worked so hard for with the other brand. So, you know, taking a hiatus or backing off and it sounds like, Angela, let me, let me know if this is true, but with Etsy, given the fact that you can put up as many products as you want and or turn on and off the shop, you have some control over that. And your caution is don't try to grow so fast. You need to be able to plan for your growth. Exactly. And back to what I was saying about Etsy is almost easy to a detriment. All right. So you are growing. Things are going well. You took a couple years off because you felt that you needed to as you were in that mix. What made you go back? So after a couple more years in public interest law, and I was still in the same field of domestic violence, at this point, I think it was like four years into doing the same thing every day, I realized that I really just couldn't manage the stress very much longer. And it was time for me to you know, find a different way to support myself for a little while. And I thought maybe I could do a mixed model where I would do law part-time. And I was only banking on what I'd been making from Etsy before, which was a part-time income. So I was like, well, there's no harm in just starting it back up to subsidize my income. I'll feel a little bit better. Ironic that Etsy was my backup plan to the (laughs) law degree, but that's what ended up happening. Wow. You know, within a few months, business picked up to its previous level, which was much faster than I thought that would happen. And so I thought about, I wonder what would happen if I treated Etsy as a full-time job. And it was just kind of a, let's see what happens type of thing. So I spent a few days learning more in depth about optimizing the site and the tools that were at my disposal. And within six months from that, it was out earning what I was making as an attorney. Wow. Were you as surprised as I am? You know, that said, I was a nonprofit attorney. So (laughs) my wages weren't like astronomical or anything, you know. I was making about, you know, probably about a teacher salary, a little more than that. So it is a livable income. It's a comfortable income. And uh, yeah, I was I was surprised and also kind of very proud of having surmounted that challenge. Sure. And I guess my surprise doesn't come in necessarily from the ability to attain that kind of income, but the speed at which you did it, you know, it came up pretty fast. Yeah, my the big surprise that I'm constantly having is that my growth has always been faster than even what I've projected. I do a lot of projections and growth goals and, you know, I've constantly exceeded them, which surprises me every time. Do you attribute it to the quality of your product or how you're promoting it? Or what do you think that is? Sometimes I feel like I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) My husband's good at reminding me that I'm constantly working, whether it's learning something new, a, a new way to do something, a new way to promote something, to market or merchandise something. You know, I am always working on it and I do treat it like a full time job. I've always treated it like a full time job since I made that decision to make it my goal. So that goes back to what you were talking about in the very beginning with your candle, you know, always building on the foundation and progressing. Right. Wonderful. All right. So this sounds fabulous. I love the story. Bring us to a time when it wasn't so good, when you're saying to yourself, oh my gosh, why did I ever start this in the first place? What was the challenge and how did you overcome the situation? That was definitely the nine months between when I reopened my Etsy store and when I decided I could quit my day job. Online sales, any retail really is completely unpredictable. And until you're kind of used to those lulls and and surges, it can be really, really just nerve wracking. You know, every time there was a lull in sales, I was convinced that I would never sell anything again. I was convinced that it was just over and this was a fluke and it's time to go back to getting a real job. So many of us go through this. It's like this for anyone in retail, especially in the beginning. It takes a while for you to learn that there are natural highs and lows. There are going to be natural you know, slowdowns and natural surges that you can never really rely on something being consistent from day to day. What you really have to concentrate on is the month over month and year over year comparisons. 
And so when you're getting into a lull, you just have to know that this too shall pass. But then now that you're at a full-time level with this, how do you plan for that financially? Well, I, I do try to save a large amount. You know, I'm making enough now that I can save at the level that I was saving when I had a traditional 401k and things like that. So I always save for those eventualities. But additionally, even the lulls now, it's kind of so busy that the lulls I'm kind of thankful for because that's the time that you spend really building the business. You know, when you start contributing to its growth by developing new products or maybe re-photographing, re-merchandising old products. All right, Gift Biz listeners, I want you to remember what Angela just said here. You know, in the times when she's making a lot of money, she's putting some aside. So saving for a rainy day, if you will, and not just going out and celebrating because sales were so great. You can do a little bit of that too, but always have the plan, especially for our industries, the ebb and flow, as we've been talking about. It's always good to make sure that you're planning, you're putting a little bit away just so you don't have that stressful time when things are down and, oh my gosh, where are we going to get the money from? Just It's better to plan when you're in the good times than try to be reaching for it when you're in the bad. Bad or low, I maybe should say. Anything you would add to that, Angela? That sums it up really well. Okay. All right. So what types of things, you're talking about SEO enhancement, but what types of things would you suggest to our listeners in terms of things that help you move the needle to bring in sales? I think the most important thing on Etsy especially is going to be your merchandising. Really, photography is the number one thing that will either launch or, or kill your shop when you're just <laughs> starting. As I mentioned before, you know, your actual product is only a very small part of the equation. And that's a very hard thing to accept at first. You know, a lot of people feel that, you know, whether it's true or not, that they have this fantastic, amazing product that everyone will want. Well, the problem is no one will know it if it's merchandised poorly. And so give us a couple of tips for merchandising. Branding is very important. You want to remember that, you know, just like tr- like uh, examples from traditional advertising, that your product should be presented in a way that's aspirational. So for example, if you're selling wedding veils, you don't want them photographed on a black background, even though, you know, you might think, oh, the, the black really makes the white pop. The problem is black isn't very bridal. So <laughs> that would be a good example. Another thing is that you just really have to keep in mind that the drawback of online selling is that the customer can't see or feel your products in person. So you have to be able to convey all of the virtues of your product in a photograph, in a very few photographs. In fact, in five photographs, you have to capture what it is about your product that are its five best selling points and kind of in an environment that's going to be motivational for your shoppers or aspirational for your shoppers. And how do you feel about putting product in a lifestyle type photo, like rings on the hand of somebody or, you know, that kind of thing? Is it more on Etsy about the product specifically versus using the product? It can be, absolutely. And unfortunately, I'm actually not very good at the lifestyle (laughs) marketing, but I have seen many shops that are excellent at it and they are very, very successful. So photography, you're suggesting make sure as your bridal example that you're merging colors or presenting the product in the right way that matches what the mindset is of the person who's going to be buying it. Anything else in terms of lighting or setup or any other tips for us on that regard, specifically with photography? If like me, you don't have any sort of background in photography, the easiest way to start is outdoor. Natural light is the easiest light to work with when you're doing photos or editing photos, a lot of people suggest light boxes, but I found the learning curve there even to be kind of steep. I do use them now, but it took me a couple of years to develop my photography skills where my light box photos didn't look very artificial. It, so in the very beginning, if you've just got a really cheap camera and you don't know anything about photography, if you go outside and go into a shady spot, don't use direct light, but go into a light, a spot where the light is diffuse or on a cloudy day, you'll get the best photos. And for photo tips, I think the most overlooked thing is uh, I would recommend that people learn about something called white balance, which really affects how true your colors come out. So for example, if you have a photo that has a white background, you'll frequently see on Etsy and other platforms that the background looks slightly gray or slightly pink or orange or blue that's because the white balance is off. And a lot of people will try to correct that by brightening the photo, but it doesn't fix the white balance because the colors are still off. 
and the photo then looks overexposed. So if you learn about something called white balance and learn how to edit that, that will really serve you well. Wonderful. Great advice. So you've made the sale. You've got the product. Now you're sending it out. Do you any, do anything special with packaging or do you include anything special so that you retain a customer and they remember you for the future? That's what I'm trying to get to with that. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I did when I decided to start treating my hobby as a business is I rebranded. I went ahead and I trademarked my business name and uh, had packaging made to uh, reflect that name and kind of an overall feel and brand. And so I have branded boxes that I put all my items in and I tie them all with a bow. So a customer feels like she's receiving a gift when she gets her item in the mail. I think that first impression really is everything. And it really does influence the customer's first impression of the actual product as well. I include a handwritten note that has the customer's name and any specific facts that I know about the customer. For example, I'll say, I hope your wife loves her present or something little like that, or best of luck on your big day for wedding orders. And uh, I sign every, every card that goes with the order. Wow. So a real personal touch for sure. Yeah. It's very important that the customers make that personal connection with you. Tell us about Etsy's back end in terms of once an order comes in, is it pretty smooth in terms of you knowing that there's an order in the shop and then fulfilling the order with capturing all the information that you need to send an order out? Absolutely. There's always room for improvements. And I I would have many suggestions for Etsy on how to improve it. But (laughs) as it stands now, it is very, very usable. It's easier than other platforms. And uh, if you make use of all the tools that they provide you with, it's, it's very, very easy. They have a great app that notifies you on your phone every time you make a sale or someone sends you a conversation. And in fact, I've become so dependent on it. The other day, my husband and I were out during business hours and I left my phone at home and I made him install all my Etsy apps and my email apps <laughs> so I could keep <laughs> on top of my shops. Again, it's almost useful to a detriment because I'm out there doing something fun and I'm still tied to my husband's phone. Yeah, well, you're a true businesswoman. That's why. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It never quite leaves your mind, you know, even when you're off doing other things, that's for sure. So, all right, Angela, I want to move on now into our reflection section. This is a look at you and how you manage and work through your day and, you know, see what types of things you call upon to be successful. If you were to think of something that you do innately that just comes because you've had this trait for your whole life, what would it be that helps you as you manage your day? I think it's a combination of being a natural problem solver, and that might come from my training as an attorney, and also resourcefulness. You know, I truly believe that there is a solution to every problem, and I'm constantly thinking of ways to make things better. And I I welcome those challenges. I don't shirk from them. In fact, you know, usually the harder something seems to me, the more determined I am to overcome it or find a better way to do it or end in a better situation than I started. Do you ever get flustered? I do. I do get flustered. And that's the biggest challenge to me has been managing growth. And there's always been a solution for the challenges I face. It's not always the solution I want. There's always been a solution to it. Wonderful. And when you think of your day, you've already talked now about the Etsy app and how important that is. But is there any other tool that you're using you call upon almost every single day to help manage the business? Yeah, I think there's a software called CraftyBase that is excellent in, for inventory management. And I think it's useful, especially for small scale crafters, because what it does is that not only does it tell you what inventory you have in stock, but it will tell you the amount of inventory that you've used and the cost of each parcel of that inventory that you use to create a product. And it's a good habit to get into right from the beginning to keep track of what assets are going out. And by assets, I don't just mean cash. A lot of people in the beginning will only look at cash in, cash out. But what you really need to look at, especially when you're designing products, is how much things cost per product. And software that helps you manage that, like CraftyBase, it's really essential for you to look at that on a day-to-day basis to make sure you're pricing right and to make sure that you're actually making a profit. Absolutely. And I think this is a hole that a lot of people go down because they're not looking at what the costs are and some of those hidden costs. Like if you were to purchase locally, you have to drive and go get it. If you're having things shipped in, there's all the shipping costs in addition to just the hard flat out, this is how much one piece of whatever the product is. 
So Crafty Base, is that a computer-based program? So someone could Google and find it online? Yes, I, I believe they're based in the UK and barely out of beta, but they work great and they're very responsive to customer feedback. Wonderful. How long have you been using them? Probably for a year. Okay. And is there a book that you've read lately that you think our listeners could find value in? Mine is so specific. It's something called The Complete Metal Smith by Tim McCrate. It's basically considered the Bible for metalsmiths. Do you often go and resource books just to continue not only, you know, your business development, but also on your craft to figure out what's the newest and latest, whether there's new techniques, new materials people are using, all that kind of thing? I hate to say this because my husband's an English major and he's an avid reader, but for business people, everything is online these days. So, so much of my, my development has been through YouTube and other resources, blogs posted by other crafters, the Etsy forums. The dynamic nature of online content makes it the best resource. Sure. And very accessible as well, of course, which leads me right into what I always like to talk about next, gift biz listeners. Just as you're listening to the podcast today, you can also learn through audiobooks. I've teamed up with Audible, and you can get an audiobook to learn about whatever aspect it is that you feel you need further development on on your business for free. All you need to do is go to giftbizbook.com and make a selection. Okay, Angela, I would like to invite you now to Dare to Dream. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What is inside your box? This sounds like a cop-out, but I feel like I would want it to still contain that unlimited possibility. Even though on a day-to-day basis, I'm a very goal-oriented person, I don't always like to know what's going to ultimately happen. When I was very little... I decided that the goal for my life was to never know where I'd be or what I'd be doing in 10 years. And while on one hand, that sounds really scary, what it really meant is that I would always have the skill or the resources to change gears if I wanted or needed to, to the point where, you know, the possibilities would truly be unlimited, even in the, whether it be the near or the far future. So I'm not sure that's really an answer to the question, but that's, That's kind of how I feel. Well, you get any gift you want. So it's really interesting how you've been talking about this because you sound so, so comfortable with the unknown. You'll figure it out. You know, whatever comes to you, you'll find the solution. Resourcefulness, I talk about all the time, how important that is, you know, because to seek out some answers and then figure it out once you've got all your information. And I would suggest that you're a pretty special person because I don't think a lot of people can feel comfortable like that. So it's very interesting that that's your answer. And I think it's something for all of us to think about in terms of how that could apply to our lives, just being able to just be out there and whatever comes, comes. And then you get to have lots of nice surprises, Angela, too. You know, putting it in that context, I absolutely agree that being an online retailer is your primary occupation. You absolutely have to be comfortable with the unknown. And <laughs> What you really just need is the confidence and the resources and the motivation to know that whatever happens, you can come out of it as a success. All right. So now I know we have sparked interest with all of our listeners. If there was one place that you would direct people to go to look at your product, where would that be? It would probably be my Etsy shop. It's brightsmith.etsy.com. Perfect. And Gift Biz listeners, you also know the show notes page will be connected up. So if you are out and about and didn't capture any of the information we've been talking about, just jump over to Gift Biz Unwrapped and look at Angela's show notes page. The links to all of her other sites will be there as well. All right, Angela, thank you so, so much for taking time today and sharing with us your information. This has really been super special. You've provided some information that I didn't know before, a great look at Etsy and your whole journey with your career. I wish you all good things and continued success with your business and may your candle always burn bright. Thank you. Learn how to work smarter while developing and growing your business. Download our guide called 25 free tools to enhance your business and life. It's our gift to you and available at giftbizunwrap.com slash tools. Thanks for listening and be sure to join us for the next episode. Today's show is sponsored by The Ribbon Print Company. Looking for a new income source for your gift business? 
customization is more popular now than ever. Brand your products with your logo or print a Happy Birthday Jessica ribbon to add to a gift right at checkout. It's all done right in your shop or craft studio in seconds. Check out the ribbonprintcompany.com for more information. After you listen to the show, if you like what you're hearing, make sure to jump over and subscribe to the show on iTunes. That way you'll automatically get the newest episodes when they go live. And thank you to those who have already left a rating and review. By subscribing, rating, and reviewing, you help to increase the visibility of Gift Biz Unwrapped. It's a great way to pay it forward to help others with their entrepreneurial journey as well. 